Was that when you started considering applying to the CIA or was this something, was that afterwards? Like what was your, what was your catalyst to like wanting to transition out of the military? And did you go straight into, you know, the intelligence community? Yeah. So honestly, after being passed up for air force intelligence and then, and then taking the force shaping plan out of the, uh, out of pilot training, I was like, I was convinced I was not a candidate for any elite U S government, anything. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm the guy that graduated with a 2.4. I'm the guy that, you know, didn't become a pilot. And now I'm the guy sitting underground. I haven't used my Chinese in four years. There's no way I qualify for anything. So I didn't even try to go to CIA. I was trying to go into the peace Corps. Um, so whenever the (laughs) completely different (laughs) sides of the spectrum, so I was like, you know what? I, I hate shining my shoes. I hate short hair. I hate shaving every day. And all I really want to do is like do the opposite of holding a, a missile key. I kind of like to go help Nigerian children learn how to read and write. And I would love to go, you know, create micro businesses in the sub-Saharan Africa region. So that's what I was signing up for. And it was during that application process, which was all online at the time, 2006, it was all online. Uh, and halfway through that Peace Corps application, I came across like a, like a red screen, like your blue screen of death. Uh, and the red screen said, you know, we, you may qualify for other positions in the US government based off of your application so far. You may qualify for other positions uh, and would you be willing to put this application on hold for 72 hours while you're considered for uh, in al- another position? Wow. So I made the same face that you just made, Justin. And I was like, hey, like opportunity can come from anywhere. So what 26 year old boy doesn't say, sure, if there's something better, pause. So yeah, I'll see what's on this. Hours. And that was how my whole CIA journey started from there. I got a, a phone call from an unlisted number. Uh, uh, that was listed, or that was only identifiable to the 703 area code. Uh, and then that was my first interaction with a CIA recruiter. Not that I knew that I was talking to CIA at the time. I just thought I was talking to, I thought I was talking to a scammer, but then real plane tickets arrived and real hotel reservations arrived. And, and then I was in the middle of a real interview process with CIA. That's crazy, man. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people may not realize you can just go to CIA.gov and apply you know, there's like a, it's like a, any other job almost. There's a job description, an application. I think one of the key things there is it says like, uh, if you are applying, don't tell your friends and family about, it. you know, obviously we're not going to, don't go announce it to the world that that's something you're wanting to do because that defeats the purpose of it. But wow, man, is that, would you say your recruitment was a, is that like an average way people get recruited or do more people apply and then get vetted that way? Yeah, so so when you look at the makeup of the of the CIA, and, that, and CIA is very cagey about its total number of employees, right? Mm-hmm. But essentially, uh, it's it's in the range of ten thousand employees at CIA. Ten thousand employees in the range. Two thousand of those employees are undercover. The other eight thousand employees are overt, not undercover. Their tax history says CIA. They tell their, they are able to tell their friends and family they work at CIA. If they want to try and be like, like, like uh, cloak and dagger about it, they can. But there's nothing. There is no cover for them to fall back on. They can't mm-hmm. say they work for the military. They can't say they work for some business. They can't say they work for somebody else. They they only work for CIA. Their mail, their paycheck comes in the mail from CIA. But those two thousand people that are undercover, that's a that's a different breed. They do not on any official documentation work for CIA. IRS doesn't know who they work for. Their bank doesn't know who they work for. CIA provides all the collateral documentation so that you can live your cover. So when you talk about CIA.gov, the 8,000 people that CIA hires for overt positions, absolutely they come from USA or from CIA.gov. Your analysts, your tech types, your disguised people, your, log- your logisticians, your IT folks, your programmers, Right? They don't live and work undercover. Those 2,000 that do live and work undercover, they come in in a variety of different ways. There are groups of them that can come through CIA.gov, but they have to have their background interactions with the website expunged, so it's not available mm. for cyber tracking. The majority of them actually come from uh, college recruiters who meet people at a college 
or get recommended by some uh, CIA recruiter who's planted in the staff at a college. Uh, uh, Texas A&M is a big recruiting college. William and Mary is a big recruiting college. Uh, uh, UCLA is a big recruiting college. Uh, so there's you know various uh, recruiters that live in colleges. There's also uh, recruiters that are regional that will work directly with referral points in intelligence programs and in national security programs at places like George Washington or, uh, or Penn State or Ohio State, uh, University of Florida. So there's like a whole network there that's looking for young people out of college. And then there's a similar network that's looking for veterans. And then there's the folks like me who get picked up because we're trying to apply to some other government program. Maybe it's Department of State, maybe it's uh, uh, Homeland Security, maybe it's FBI, but we trigger something in some uh, back law, like uh, back end algorithm that fits this particular opportunity. So then they reach out to us because, I mean, I was, I've been with the Air Force since I was 17 years old. They're, my entire life history is known to the US government. So they mm -hmm. knew exactly who they were talking to when they called me. Yeah. Yeah. Is it easier for, I mean, I imagine it's easier for veterans to get into it, right? As long as they didn't have a, you know, a bad history in the military. Yeah, correct. So the normal application, the normal onboarding process, interviewing, onboarding and everything takes about nine months, nine to 18 months. My process took six months because I already had the clearances. I already had the SF-86 completed. Um, all of my blood records, all of my medical history, everything was right there. So all they really mm -hmm. needed to do with me was just put me through the psych evals and the intelligence tests, and et cetera, uh, to see if I was able to carry my, my own in the job. That's true. You know, you did come out, you said you had a TSSCI, which obviously a majority of people aren't leaving the military with, the, with that high of a clearance. So that, that obviously puts you in a different kind of category there. You know, what would you say to someone that's considering that as an option after they leave the service or just in general, what, how should they approach it? You know, how should they approach the whole application process or even trying to get recruited or something like that? What sets them up to be a better candidate for the organization? Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you are active duty and you're looking to get into CIA specifically, then I would I would talk to your intelligence, your J3 uh, outfit at your base, because it's almost guaranteed they have a CIA contact. They may not be able to say who it is, but they will for sure have a contact there. So you can talk to anybody in that J3 unit and say, hey, I'm up for leaving and I want to cross train into military or I want to cross train into CIA. You know, can you, can you put me in contact with your CIA counterpart? That's an easy way to do it. If you don't have a J3 or if you don't know where the J3 sits, talk to whoever the commander is of your unit and tell your commander, frankly, I'm, I'm trying to go into CIA. It's what I want to do. I want to have that application process because everybody in the military is going to be just one step away from a CIA point of contact for every mm -hmm. military unit. It doesn't mean that CIA contact is well-placed or well-plugged in or even dedicated to that air base or that military base, but you'll have somebody that's just two steps removed from where you are. The average civilian doesn't have that. So try to make that contact and at least have a sit down conversation with that person about the realities of that lifestyle, the realities of that workforce. And they will be able to help vet you as to whether or not you are a reasonable candidate to be undercover or to be overt, to be an analyst or to be a technician or whatever else that might be. Uh, it's very helpful. For sure, you're not going to get into CIA's clandestine service, their, their DO, as it's called right now, unless you have a college degree. So if you're on, on the fence about a college degree, but you want to go professional intel, you got to get a college degree. And then once you have, that's the first thing they're going to ask you if you talk to a CIA representative. They're going to ask right out of the gates, do you have your college degree? Because they, they know if you want national clandestine service, undercover traveling the world, you have to have a college education to do that. Just silly government bureaucracy, right? But that's just the way they see it. So those are I've, the two things I absolutely recommend. I've posed a question to multiple Marine Corps officers on here about, because they also require a college degree to become an officer, right? In 2022, with the access of information that we have, the ability to go and learn about things or even to go become a professional in a job that doesn't require a college degree, do you think that's kind of a silly requirement still? Like a, no, an old, I don't think like it's a, a valid requirement. 
You think it's valid? I do not. No. Oh, okay. I think it's OBE, brother. It's over. It's outdated. It's overcome by events, just like what you're saying. But this is the this is our kryptonite in the U.S. military and in the, in the United States writ large. Bureaucracy and administrivia is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, like 50 years ago, do I think a college degree differentiated people? Absolutely. 20 years ago, did a college degree differentiate people? Yeah, pretty much, right? It really kind of showed the people who were willing to suck eggs from the yeah. people who weren't willing to suck eggs. And if you're going to be a military officer, you're going to suck a lot of friggin' eggs in your life, <laughs> right? So yeah. that's all. But that's what college was good for. Over the last 10 years, man, information is at everybody's fingertips. You have, we have literally watched the non-commissioned officer cadre outperform and out-educate the commissioned officer cadre in every military service, right? Like lieutenants are now being taught to just listen to their NCO. Mm -hmm. That, like that, the practicality, the operational utility of understanding the knowledge and experience base of your NCO cadre, that needs to be formalized into a different category. It's what we see with petty officers is the closest thing where petty officers are, are like highly skilled, highly intelligent, highly capable non-commissioned officers. Uh, and they're given the leeway to earn commissioned officer paychecks and have commissioned officer rights. Um, but there's still this hang up that I don't know how and when some administrator is going to make it a priority to change it. But that's just the reality we have to deal with. Yeah, I'm, I'm on I'm on the same page. I mean, I look at you look at the military, let's say we need an engineering officer or something like that. Why wouldn't I want somebody that just spent four or five years from 18 to 22 or 23 working in the trades as a construction yep. person that understands what it takes to build something? Maybe they're not like an engineer at that time, but you, you're you going to send them to military school to train on that anyway. Just like you right. would send the guy that has a literature, you know, degree and to learn how to go become an engineer for that. Right. You know, so to me, it's like we're we're – taking out a whole pool of people when, when you also, you look at only, I think only like 25 or maybe less, just a little bit less, 25% of the country goes to college. So 75% mm -hmm. of the people out there are automatically blocked off as not being, being capable, but you know, what kind of knowledge and st stuff are we leaving behind? Or are we not putting on the table because of that, you know? Yeah. So one of the things, this is one of those areas where, uh, where frankly, I feel like we are overdue for the kind of recruitment crisis that we're having right now, because now all those bean counters in the military, all those those bureaucrats in the government, they have to be asking themselves the same question. They mm -hmm. have to be asking, what if we change our standards? What if we had, like, uh, like what you were saying, if they, um, there's a huge, a huge population that doesn't even qualify to be considered for the officer corps. If you were to give them, if you were to change the qualifications, but not change the eligibility, you still have to show that you're knowledgeable in something. You still have to demonstrate your, your mental proficiency. You still have to show that you can handle something cognitively. Mm -hmm. If you can show it, then we don't care about whether or not you have a diploma behind your name. You clearly have the capacity to be a leader, to be an officer, to have a successful career. How much would that change uh, our current recruitment crisis? They have to be asking themselves this question now and thank God we're having a crisis now or else they would never ask themselves that question. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I was talking to a guy the other day who was on the podcast, and he, he was an instructor at Quantico for the new lieutenants and stuff. And he's like, you know, we're getting a lot of book smart people, but not a lot of street smart people. And that's really driving kind of policy and stuff. And it, it really messes things up because those of us that have street smarts obviously realize the plan doesn't always work out the way, you know, that the smart people that put it together hoped it would. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you when you're when you're recruiting specifically from college graduates, the the specific egg that they have been taught to suck is a book. It's that's what you're going to get. And that's why they're all being taught to follow the lead of their non-commissioned officer, because that person has street smarts. And they're hoping mm -hmm. that, you know, in the four to six years that it takes, the four to seven years it takes to make captain that you're or the oh three that in the time frame it makes it takes for you to make 03, you will have learned enough apprenticing your NCO that you will be a capable leader. Well, I mean, come on, man. That seems like a poor economic decision in terms of how to bring a, a resource up to speed for a military task. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Can't we save money and save time if we simply open the gates to anyone who demonstrates the capacity against a, cer a certain standard? Or direct commissioning, you know, is another thing too. Hey, guy's been in for six years. He's been stellar the whole time. He's great at his job. Why wouldn't we want to put him in charge? Yep. You know, why Boom. wouldn't we want to do that?